the Tech Canada Leadership Standard, hosted by Tech Speaker of the Year and branding expert, Gare Maxwell. Real life stories from leaders spanning the business spectrum. Now more than ever, leaders are shifting through significant decisions under accelerated timeframes with less information and bigger consequences for their companies, for their people, and for the communities that they live in. You're about to learn of the triumphs, failures, struggles and disruptions through the first-hand account of an industry leader. Join us now for the Leadership Standard. Welcome back, and I can't wait to introduce you to our featured guest, David Meerman Scott, who wrote The New Rules of Marketing and PR way before the days of Facebook and YouTube. He was a beacon of light in terms of where everything was going in terms of social media. The new rules of marketing and PER, and PR has sold something like 400,000 copies in 29 different languages. But it's his new book, Fanocracy, that has really captured our attention. How to turn fans into customers and customers into fans. And it's a revealing insider look at how fan culture can boost any business or brand. We love to explore subjects that forward-thinking leaders care about David Meerman Scott, which is why we're so delighted to have you on the program and talk to us about fanocracy and why it matters to leaders today. Thanks a lot, Gareth. It's really great to be here. Um, and I'm looking forward to having a discussion with you because um, in many ways we think alike. Uh, so this will be great. Yeah. So. Before we dive into the book just a little bit, you're based in Boston. Yes. You actually co-wrote this book with your daughter, Reiko. Yeah. And She's... now that must have been an experience in of itself. It was um, amazing. Uh, it brought us closer together, which was really great. Um, and it was really important for this particular book to have her as a co-author because, you know, as a 50-something-year-old man who um, I have the things that I'm a fan of, um, but I really thought that it was essential to bring in um, my daughter's thinking. So she's, a, she's also a better writer than I am, so that's another important aspect. Um, but she's, you know, she's obviously a different generation, um, being my daughter. She's obviously a different gender, um, but she's mixed race. My wife's Japanese so she's half Japanese uh, and she comes at very different fandoms she's a fan of her huge fan of Harry Potter and uh, she um, wrote a 90,000 word alternative ending to the Harry Potter series where Draco Malfoy is a spy for the Order of the Phoenix and put that up on a fan fiction site that's been downloaded um, thousands of times and hundreds of comments. Um, and so she comes at fandom from a different perspective. She gets dressed up every year and goes to Comic-Con. And she's a neuroscientist, um, which I decidedly am not. She graduated with a neuroscience degree from Columbia and is now in her final year of medical school. So contrast that with me, liberal arts degree, you know, I'm a, I'm a, a white man who loves the Grateful Dead. Um, so you combine those and we come at fandom from two very different angles. And the angle that I know our audience is really curious to know is whether it's the Grateful Dead or whether it's Harry Potter, what is it about fan culture that business leadership needs to be plugged into today? Because we in our audience, David, we have leaders of all kinds of companies from B2C to B2B to nonprofit, and this will strike them as a little bit out of left field. And yet, I know your superpower is that ability to see patterns way before they actually happen. So maybe expand on a little bit why what you've discovered in fanocracy is so relevant to our listeners. Absolutely. So um, you mentioned my, uh, I've got, uh, I've written 10 books, but you, you mentioned the one I'm most uh, known for, which is the new rules of marketing and PR. And that was really the book that defined digital marketing in a social media and real time world. And um, I've delivered hundreds of speeches around the world, 46 different countries, believe it or not, all seven continents on the idea of digital communications. And what I've found is that 
the pendulum has swung too far in the direction of superficial online communications at a time when people are hungry for true human connection. And, um, you know, I live in the States. Our politics is incredibly polarized. Um, I'm seeing things coming out of Canada where the same things is, are happening in your country. Um, everyone is dumbing down and uh, there are online communications and there's, you don't even know if you're communicating with a robot these days on social media. So people are telling me um, that they're looking for a true human connection. So the idea of being a fan of something is a true connection. You know, it's when I go to a, a, a live music show or when my daughter goes to Comic-Con or when she talks with her friends about Harry Potter, it's, a, it's the human connection that's important. So we spent five years researching this idea of what makes people a fan, both from the neuroscience perspective as well as the emotional perspective. And then we created a nine step plan for how any organization can create fans. And we've got examples in the book and we can touch on them um, if it makes sense today. We've got examples of in the book from uh, an insurance company, a company that makes underwear, a company that makes batteries, a, a, a several different technology companies, uh, a wooden surfboard manufacturer. And all of them have figured out how to tap this incredible power of fans. Uh, and it really is about this idea of a true human connection. I love that, David, because if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is that your idea in fanocracy transcends any basic product or service. Um, in other words, you could be manufacturing dump trucks, mm -hmm. or you could be selling flowers on a street corner. Exactly and, and right. somehow you could tap into fanocracy. That's exactly right. You got it, Garrett. It's, um, it's about tapping the same human connections with any product or service or company or idea that J.K. Rowling tapped with Harry Potter or the members of the Grateful Dead were able to tap. Um, and I'll give you one example that excites me the most, um, that we learned from interviewing many different neuroscientists. And it's the idea of proximity and how important that is for we humans. So I learned this um, idea of proximity from this, the neuroscience is that it's hardwired in our brains. We can't help it to have a stronger emotional connection with other human beings the closer that they are to us. And there's actually a neuroscientist named Edward T. Hall who identified the different zones of influence. And they start with the public zone, which is further than 20 feet away. Incidentally, the public zone is, uh, is where um, the audience is when you're delivering a speech on stage. It's more than 20 feet away from you. Um, and and uh, we humans are aware of people who are more than 20 feet away from us, but we don't have a strong connection with them. The next zone is called social space. That's from four feet to 20 feet. And within the social space is um, it, we begin to track people who get into that space. So that's why when you go to a cocktail party, you um, consciously and subconsciously scan the room. You want to know, your, your, your ancient brain wants to know, are there friends in here? Are there foes in here? Do I need to be worried? Is there a potential mate in here? And you can't help it. You're hardwired to do that. Uh, and then the next zone is the uh, personal space, which is about a foot and a half to four feet. There's also intimate space, but that's not used really for business. That's very close personal friends and, and, and relatives. So within personal space is cocktail party uh, space distance, you know, about an arm's length away. So when you're sharing a drink with somebody, that's the personal space. Now, if you are comfortable with somebody and you trust them, you have a very strong, positive emotional reaction the closer you get to someone. 
Um, so you're having that conversation, a cocktail party, very positive emotional response. If you don't trust someone, you can have a negative emotional response. Like when you step into a crowded elevator, you don't know those people and you can't help it. It is an ancient brain taking over. What that means for all of us, for you, for me, for any business person is, and it's real simple. The more you can get into the social and personal space of your existing and potential customers and partners, the stronger the emotional connection will be. And incidentally, for people like you and me who, who deliver speeches, if it's possible to come down from on high on the stage and interact for a brief moment with people um, in their personal space, in the audience, that's an incredibly positive thing for a public speaker to do. But anybody, whether they're selling dump trucks or flowers on the street, is able to figure out how can I more often get into the personal space and social space of my customers. And on that note, now I'd love to hear that example, one of those real life examples where this is actually being used in a real life business, David, and we're actually seeing results. So I'm going to cite the entire American RV industry. And this is fascinating. But I need to back up for just a moment and share one more aspect about the magic of proximity. And that is that another aspect of neuroscience is around um, what's called mirror neurons. And mirror neurons are the part of our brains that fire when we see or sometimes hear somebody do something. Our brain fires in exactly the same way as if we were doing it ourselves. So, for example, if I were to take a bite of a lemon, oh my gosh, my eyes scrunch up, my mouth puckers and immediately begins to water. I, my, I, I just can't help it. My face kind of contorts a little bit because that lemon is so sour. And I would bet, Gare, that you and other people in the audience may be having a little bit of saliva in your mouth because you're tasting that lemon a little bit too. That's mirror neurons in action in your brain. So what that means is that the more we can use video and the more we can use photographs that are shot and cropped in such a way as, it, as you have people in your personal space, the better. That's why we feel we know a television personality. We don't know them. We've never met them. But the, our mirror neurons tell us that when we see them on a screen that we know them. And so um, the use of video, the use of, of Instagram and photos, the use of, of great photos on your website is a, is a very powerful way to build fans. So now I, I promised you I'd talk about the RV industry. So the RV industry in um, the United States in 2007 sold something like 400,000 units. But in 2008, during the downturn, it was only about 200,000 RVs that were sold because of, uh, of the economy. It was, it was terrible for the RV industry. And they realized that they needed to make a change in the way they sell and throughout the entire industry. So what they did was remarkable. They focused on this idea of proximity and they focused on how they can create images for the entire industry and even create products around proximity. The research that they did told them that the average older person who's an RV enthusiast, um, so people in their 50s and 60s and 70s, tended to travel in a family unit. However, young people, millennial generation, those in, in their late teens and 20s and early 30s, tended to camp in friend groups. So large groups, 10 people, 15 people, 20 people in multiple RVs who want to camp together. It turns out 
the product was wrong in the RV industry because campsites were built around uh, family units, not around the millennial units. So um, I spoke with the head of KOA, Camp Grounds of America, which runs 500 campgrounds around the United States. They actually created some campsites specifically for millennials where they can park multiple RVs or pitch multiple tents, then have a communal fire pit and a communal place to eat. And then they used photographs of those people camping and pushed those out through social media and used those in the way that they, they communicated. And then the RV industry that makes the RVs got on board with this that they called it, they, they call it Go RVing is the campaign. And they ended up actually rocketing past their previous high number of units sold and in 2017 were over 500,000 units, all based on the idea that proximity is essential to have this human relationship. Camping, they discovered, was not just about being in the great outdoors and fishing and looking at beautiful vistas and maybe seeing some animals. It was about human connection. And now there's more fans of going RVing than there has ever been before. More people want to camp than ever wanted to camp before, part of it because of this initiative. So they're not buying four wheels with a, with, with a bunk bed they're really buying human connection. In the That's exactly right. That was the insight. They weren't buying being in nature with animals. They were buying human connection to like-minded people. And, and that's, what, that's what this idea of fanocracy is. That's what mm. this idea of a true human connection is, is this idea that it's about people. It's about that connection. It's about people interacting with other like-minded people. I, I can't help but wonder um, that leaders need to embrace their own fandom first in order to get other people to connect. Does that make any sense, David? Is I'm following you, are, you are absolutely correct, my friend. We, we really dug into this topic and we learned a couple of things on that front. Number one, passion is infectious. Passion is infectious. What that, what that means is that the more an executive, people who are running companies, the more they're passionate about something, and it doesn't matter what it is. It can be sailing. It can be uh, playing softball. It can be like me going to live music shows or like me going surfing um, or knitting or bird watching. It doesn't matter what it is. But when you're passionate about something, that passion shines through. And what I've noticed with many executives, especially when you look at people's LinkedIn profiles, it's all business all the time. Mm. We don't often have a chance to get to know the real person, yet that's the human connection that brings people together is who is that real person? What do you love to do? How can I bond with you as a person rather than just an automatron that works at a company? And so we learned that from the executive perspective, the more passion you can showcase, the better. But this gets, even, this gets even more interesting because we also learned that those companies that hire for passion, that's more likely to be sick, breed success than hiring for someone who might be the right person for the job based on their qualifications and their past um, job experience. So um, we ran into one young woman who runs marketing for a technology company, she says, the first question I ask somebody is, if you were in a room with a thousand people, what would you confidently say you are the best at, better than anybody else in that room? And that gets people talking about what they're passionate about. And based on how they answer that question, that's the first question they ask in an interview, they, she immediately decides whether she's going to uh, bring this person back for another interview. Because if they can showcase that passion that they have, they're much more likely to be an effective employee because passion is infectious. 
And that's why you wear the Grateful Dead proudly on your sleeve. But what I found interesting, interesting, David, in reading the excerpt from the book was that that was the catalyst because of some stickers on your computer to an unbelievable relationship with a significantly you know, successful company. Yeah, that's exactly right. So what happened was that the new rules of marketing and PR originally came out in 2007. So I, um, uh, I got an email from Brian, uh, Brian Halligan, who's the CEO of a company called HubSpot. Um, and at the time, HubSpot was tiny, uh, less than 10 employees. They only had beta software and, um, and they had no customers. They're trying to create some marketing software. And so they invited me to come to their office. It was very close, only 10 miles from my house. So I said, sure, I'll come and check it out. So I went and I walked into the meeting room. And this was quite literally the first minute that I had met Brian and a couple of his colleagues were there too. And I opened up my notebook computer and it had some stickers on it. And Brian said, hang on, hang on. We can't start this meeting until you tell us about those stickers on your computer. And so I had three stickers he was interested in. One of them was Nantucket Island, um, an island off the coast of Massachusetts here where I live. And I said, I love Nantucket. I have a vacation house there. I go every summer. And Brian says, I go there every summer too. What about the Japan sticker? And I said, oh, I lived in Japan for seven years. My wife is Japanese. Japan's very important to me. He goes, I lived in Japan too. What about the Grateful Dead sticker on your computer? And I said, love the Grateful Dead. They're my favorite band. I've been to something like 50 Grateful Dead shows at the time. It was about 50. Brian says, I love them too. And I've been to over a hundred shows. So we became instant friends simply because we shared the same passions. And Brian said, great, let's go to lunch together. We went to lunch together. Um, we then went to a Grateful Dead show together a couple of weeks later. And then he invite, invited me to become the very first member of the HubSpot advisory board. And I joined the advisory board in 2007 I'm still on the HubSpot advisory board 12 years later. They now um, have 65,000 customers. They're traded on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, last time I checked, they had something like a $7 billion market cap, 3,000 employees. Um, I've been to something like 100 concerts with Brian since then. Uh, I went to Japan to help them open their office and gave a speech. And he's been to my place on Nantucket a couple of times. So that's an illustration that when you showcase what you're a fan of in business, that can be something that's incredibly powerful. And in my case, by simply showcasing that I'm a fan of Japan and Nantucket Island and the Grateful Dead, I created one of the strongest and most lucrative, by the way, because I've been paid in equity ever since, no, no cash, um, uh, one of the most lucrative and important business relationships in my entire career. But like I said earlier, so many people are unwilling to share what they're person, personally passionate about in a business setting because they feel it should be all business all the time. And I think in today's polarized world where people, there's so many people being mean to one another uh, on the social networks and on the on the news that you know some goodness in the world goes a long way and that's a really important element of fanocracy is that there are are good things in the world to celebrate. And I know this sometimes sounds like an airy fairy kind of California-esque idea, but I'm a tr I actually do believe that the universe gives back what you give to it. And if you give good vibes and you give things away, you give gifts without any expectation of anything in return, the universe gives you good things back. And that's true of being a fan of something. When you're a fan of something, people become a fan of you and your company. And that's one way to grow business. So in your studies over the years, beyond the neuroscience, beyond the new rules of marketing and PR, it's inevitable, David, in your work, you come face to face with leaders, just like Brian from HubSpot that you just met. You see leaders all the time. Now I'm kind of setting you up here a little bit with this question. But I run into leaders too, and I keep hearing that 
um, that mentality that says, well, I've got my business life over here and my personal life over here. And, and, and of course, all of that tends to get reflected um, in the online world as well. Love to hear your thoughts on that. So yes, we all do have our own personal lives. I know I recognize that there are some boundaries that some people don't want to cross. If you don't want to share photographs of your children on your social networks that go to, to business colleagues, I understand that. And I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. You know, if, if for security reasons, you don't want to share that you're traveling at a particular time for fear that somebody might then know that you're not at home. I understand that too, but I do believe that it's very, very important to show that you know you you love a particular sports team, you are a huge fan of a particular rock band, um, you are unbelievably passionate about classic Land Rovers. Um, you know whatever that passion is shows that you're an interesting human being that other people will want to be connected to. So, in your opinion, and your own study of leaders. Is there any one thing, David, that you can pinpoint and say, that's the thing that stops people from embracing their own fandom? Um, it's interesting. I've asked the question of about 3,000 people. I ask the following three questions. Number one, I say, um, how many fan, big fanocracies are you a part of? You know, this is after I've described what a fanocracy is. I have three. I am a huge fan of live music, especially the Grateful Dead. I'm a huge fan of the Apollo Lunar Program. I have one of the best private collections of Apollo artifacts in the world. I wrote a book called Marketing the Moon um, that was turned into a movie called Chasing the Moon, which I was a producer on. And I love to surf. I'm really into surfing, but I'm, I'm not very good at it, but I love it. So those are my three major fanocracies. It turns out the average person of the 3,000 people we, we asked has two and a half. And then when I ask people, um, of the one you're the most passionate, when did you start with that particular fanocracy? It turns out the average age is age 12. And that's around the time that you reach puberty. So it turns out when you reach puberty is when you, you grasp a hold of this thing that you're most passionate about. And then... I ask people what they're passionate about, and they give me all sorts of wonderful answers. You know, they're into this, that, and the other thing, which is really cool. But there's about 5% of the population who, who say they don't have a passion for anything. They don't have any fanocracy, which is really interesting to me. So what I encourage those people to do is think back to when they were in elementary school and about to reach puberty, sort of age 11, 12, 13, 14 ish. What were they most passionate about then? Can they rekindle that passion? And can that be something that they become a fan of? Um, because we all are more engaged as humans when we do have something that we're very, very passionate about. You've been described, David Meerman Scott, as not being very good at following the pack. <laughs> On a scale this is of true. Ten, <laughs> on a scale of one to ten, how weird are you? Oh my gosh! Um, I was certainly um, approaching ten, eight, or nine ish. Um, yeah, I I just can't follow the pack. If someone says everyone is doing this, I want to know what the alternative is. What room in your house most resonates with you? I am in my office right now in my house. I had worked in offices my entire career for 30 something years. And in the last two years, my wife and I updated our house in a major way. And um, I have the, the most fabulous office. It's big, it overlooks the woods, it's, it's amazing. If there was no boundaries to what I'm about to suggest, who would you want to, who would you want to play you in your biopic? <laughs> oh my gosh, that's an amazing question. Tom Hanks, how about that? What are the books you're reading right now? 
right now. Um, I just started reading a book called The Meritocracy um, Trap, and it, it's interesting. It's uh, it's about how um, people get trapped in trying to constantly do better, and and kids, uh, parents send their kids to elite colleges and so on. And it's an interesting look at how we as a society are polarized. Because this is a show that focuses on leadership, what is the one leadership quality you think that's most needed in the world today? Empathy. I think, I think that we're living in a, a, a culture now that um, it's, it, it, it's sort of swaying into meanness and nastiness. And I think the more we can empathize with our employees, with our customers, with our partners, with the world at large, uh, I think the, 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 the better leader we will, will become. We always like to wrap up this uh, show, David, with uh, a tribute to the work of uh, the French journalist Bernard Pivot and the host of Inside the Actor Studio, James Lipton. We call it the Lipton Pivot Survey. Uh -huh. David Meerman Scott being listened to worldwide on this podcast, what is your favorite word? Yes. What is your least favorite word? No. What turns you on? Something I've never done before. What turns you off? The same old thing. What sound or noise do you love? Live music. What sound or noise do you hate? The screeching of a train. What is your favorite curse word? <laughs> um, I don't use them. What profession, other than your own, would you like to attempt? I will never attempt it, but I've always wanted to be a rock star. What profession would you never, under any circumstances, no matter how much money, would you ever do? Something illegal. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear being said when you finally arrive at the pearly gates? Here are all of the friends who left before you did. And finally, David Meerman Scott, what is your personal creed or motto? The four or five words you live by. The more you give to the universe, the more the universe gives back. Well said, my friend, and so looking forward to diving deeper into fanocracy. Any final thoughts on the book? Any acknowledgments? Because I know with any author, David, it's never a solo project. And I know this is a book you're really excited about. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. It's amazing to have written it with my daughter. Tony Robbins did the forward to the book. Um, there's a lot more at fanocracy.com. And I really appreciate you having me on, Gar. Thanks again, David, and continued success. You too. Fanocracy, as defined by David Meerman Scott, an organization that inspires extreme passion for a product, a brand, an idea by putting customers' needs and wishes at the center of everything it does. We so appreciate David Meerman Scott appearing here on the Leadership Standard. Incredible, revealing insights from one of the most foremost authorities on modern day brand building in the 21st century. So we appreciate uh, David for joining us. And of course, if you want to know much more about Tech Canada here from the Leadership Standard and our programs, just go to the website, www.tech-canada.com. Now, I don't know about you, but what was it about what David Meerman Scott spoke of that made you stop, ponder, think how could fanocracy be applicable to your business your organization i'm mulling things over but i really want to hear what you have to say what were your thoughts feel free share them with me directly love to hear from you the email is gare at garemaxwell.com g-a-i-r at 
G-A-I-R-M-A-X-W-E-L-L.com. If you enjoy The Leadership Standard, feel free to share with others in your online social networks. Who knows? We just might, through the spirit of fanocracy, inspire someone else to kick it up a gear or two and enjoy a higher level of business, personal, and professional success. Thanks again for listening to The Leadership Standard.